First of all, I want to thank the hardworking staff at SOCNIS for pulling this conference together. Secondly, I thank all of you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us today. I hope you will find many useful and very powerful references to things that can help you through your career, whether you are being mentored or are a mentor to SOCNIS students. There are many different opportunities that I've had that were totally unplanned. As you've heard, I'm at Mayo Clinic Florida. I never thought of myself becoming a physician on the staff of Mayo Clinic. I ended up coming here after 10 years in solo practice in Bismarck, North Dakota. I wanted the best possible treatment for my cancer patients. And so I joined a community clinical trials group, which ultimately led to Mayo Clinic offering me a position at the Rochester campus. You may not know, but there are three Mayo Clinic campuses, the main one, the oldest one in Rochester, Minnesota, the second one in Jacksonville, Florida, and the third one in Scottsdale, Arizona. At Mayo, we practice what we call our three shields. The first shield is patient care. We all want to give the best possible care to our patients every day. Secondly, we realize that without research, we can't get new treatments to offer our patients. My research over the years has focused on clinical trials, women's cancers, melanoma, and population sciences for American Indian and Alaska Native populations. The third shield is education, not only educating physicians and scientists, but educating our patients to take better care of themselves and to educate whole populations that are at risk for many different diseases, including what we're seeing now with COVID. On the left is my good friend and longtime colleague, David Baines, who practiced for many years up in Alaska. Here you see David honoring his younger brother, Jonathan Baines. Jonathan earned a dual degree at Mayo Clinic in MD, PhD. I hope that some of you that are listening to us today are choosing that dual degree. In doing so, you will need a lot of different help along the way. And if you would like to reach out to Dr. Baines or me about the MD PhD programs and how, how students get through that very arduous training, please don't hesitate to contact me. Every journey starts with a first step. And my first steps were with my grandma, Ada Salmon. Ada had a hard life. She didn't have any formal education. My father was the oldest of her 11 children, and he was born in the Choctaw town of Atoka, Oklahoma. He didn't finish high school, but he and my grandmother wanted me to get a better education. My grandmother told me that I was meant to be a healer. And while I didn't know at a young age what that meant, I knew that there was indigenous knowledge that she was teaching me and that I needed to further my education as both my grandmother and my father and my mother encouraged me to do that. I never knew my maternal grandmother because she died when my mother was four. My mother's mother died of tuberculosis, which took a lot of families by surprise back in those days. My mother went from the TB sanitarium to an orphanage there, she also was affected by diseases such as measles and chickenpox, which left her with impaired hearing and vision, and those affected her the rest of her life. So my mother never graduated from high school either. So I'm the first in my family to graduate from high school or go to college or graduate from college, and I'm certainly the first doctor in the family. So many of you out there may be the first Maybe it's the first high school graduate. Maybe you're the first college graduate. Maybe you're the first one to want a PhD. But someone has to start that process and help you in your family to set those goals for yourself. Well, I listened to my mother and my grandmother and my father, and I stayed in school. And when I was in high school, 
I discovered that I love the sciences. I love to find new information. Here you see on the left, Dr. James Watson and his co-investigator, Francis Crick, on the right. They won the Nobel Prize for discovering the backbone of DNA, the so-called double helix. Little did I know when I went to those Saturday morning seminars at the University of Chicago, how much DNA would influence medicine of the future. Interestingly, I was only 15 when I met Dr. Watson. And many, many years later, when he was about 80 years old, I actually sat next to him at dinner at a medical conference. I was able to tell him how important his stimulating talks were to me that kept me wanting to stay in the sciences. Well, some of you may have a very direct path to your goals. You may go from high school to college, to graduate school, to PhD or MD or MD, PhD with no lags in between. But many of us have to take a crooked path. And in my case, I continued to love learning. I did get my college degree. And because I love sciences, I became a science teacher. And because I love children, I wanted to have my own child. So I stayed home. I was a stay-at-home mom before I made the decision that I needed to go back and finish those pre-med courses in order to apply to medical school. I could only do so because my husband was so supportive. And Alan said to me, I don't want to hear 10 years from now, I wish we had done this. He said, let's do it. So there I was in the second class at the University of North Dakota of the Indians into Medicine program. Little did I know how much was going to be involved in how many years of training, but I was excited to be there. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of studying. And while I was busy studying, instead of running around the park with my daughter, my husband took on the load of not only his own career as an actuary, but the house care issues and managing and even gave up some opportunities of his own career in order to support what I was doing to go through school. So we eventually put many years in, in order to get to this point. The InMed program at that time did not have a four year direct program. And so I had to transfer and we chose the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. So off we went to Colorado. My husband had to get a new job. My daughter had to have a new school. I had to get used to a new group. All of those things were exciting, but also a bit scary. It was in Colorado that I discovered that I loved cancer research. And one of the tasks I was given to learn was to learn how to grow malignant melanoma cells in the laboratory. Up to that point, all of the studies had been done with mouse melanoma but human melanoma cells had not been successfully passaged for multiple generations in order to study their growth patterns. So I was successful and I spent lots of hours doing that and found it fascinating. Dr. William Robinson was my mentor for both the laboratory and for several of my clinical rotations at the University of Colorado Medical Center. He was a translational researcher with the ideal of bench to bedside. Go to the laboratory, find answers to how cancer cells grow or don't grow, and then take it to the clinic to try to develop new treatments for cancer patients. When I went to the clinic, he also taught me about epidemiology, understanding how to look at the patient history and the patient to see why some patients get a cancer like melanoma and others don't. It might be their skin type, their hair color, their eye color, their sun exposure. So that field of epidemiology is one that I studied later in trying to look at other cancers in American Indians and Alaska Natives. American Indians and Alaska Natives don't get much melanoma, but breast cancer, colon cancer, cervical cancer, epidemiology was very important for understanding the cancers that they developed. This slide is a schematic of how cancer cells might grow. It's facetious and it's meant to call your attention to the fact that pathways that seem to go in the right direction oftentimes then don't do what you think they do. If you've ever been in the laboratory, you know that sometimes your hypothesis 
and the data that comes out of an experiment don't match, then that sometimes takes you down a different pathway and a new insight to what you're trying to research. It also is an example of what happens in developing your career. In other words, you might think you have the perfect plan to go down this pathway to get your degree, to get this particular job in this particular place, but then things happen, life happens, COVID happens, and all of a sudden you have to make a different plan, or you get an opportunity that never occurred to you, and that takes you down a whole new and exciting pathway. I want you to be open to those possibilities. Those opportunities are going to come along. So in spite of all the twists and turns and job changes and moving from being a stay-at-home mom to a medical student to a resident to uh, a fellow to starting a practice in North Dakota to being recruited to Minnesota, and now we're in Florida, I guess we've shown we're resilient. One of the things that happened because I was doing this seminal research on melanoma at Colorado, I got invited to my very first international conference. And I found that I loved giving talks at international conferences and meeting people from all over the world. So there was a mix of pleasure and science at the same time. One of the things that's unique about Mayo Clinic is that they want us to go and share a lot of knowledge at meetings all over this country and indeed all over the world. And I continue to do that to this day. I want to remind you to stay connected with your professional societies, whether it's SOCNIS or the Microbiology Association or the Public Health Association. The American Society of Clinical Oncology gave me my first grant to study malignant melanoma. Most societies have travel scholarships to their annual meetings. Many of them have research awards that they will give to start new investigators going. So you need to make those connections. Once we're out of this totally virtual world, hopefully you will be able to meet people in your field from all over the country, all over the world, and find your own way to develop those networks. So over your career, you will have many mentors. This one reminds me of Dr. James Hampton, who was the very first American Indian medical oncologist. He and I have worked together now for over 30 years. I didn't know he existed when I was in medical school. I didn't know about him until I was very advanced in my career. You saw that one of my early mentors was Dr. Robinson, and many times you will have mentors who are not the same gender or the same ethnicity or the same race, and each will have something to contribute to the knowledge that you need or the skills that you need to acquire. Here are two female mentors, same gender as I am, and on the left is uh, a woman who was my seventh grade teacher. Rose Brown wasn't a doctor, wasn't a PhD, but she was an inspiring teacher, and we need those teachers on the early level to encourage patients and and students to go into uh, the field of their choice. The other one, Dr. Linda Burhan-Stepanoff, famously known as Dr. Linda B, is a contemporary and a friend. And Linda and I complement one another. We do lots of projects together. She's PhD trained, I am not. She doesn't have the medical background, I do. And together we have developed community-based participatory research over the country and we have even given conferences all over the world to indigenous populations. So Linda B and Dr. Um, Hampton and I developed a program called Native Circle that was funded by the National Cancer Institute. Native Circle has been disseminating culturally appropriate materials all over the country and all over the world now for over 20 years. So we have materials that were for low literacy populations and therefore they've been extremely popular with other populations as well. This is a picture taken from the small aircraft that I had to take to go into this village off of Kodiak, Alaska. We sometimes think of disparities as only being access to health insurance. We forget that there are many populations in our country and particularly American Indian populations in faraway places where it's very difficult to get a colonoscopy, 
very difficult to get a mammogram. So in this case, we were invited, Dr. David Baines and I, to go talk to the population about colon cancer. We don't understand why yet, but Alaska Natives have some of the highest colon cancer rates, not only in Native populations, not only in this country, but in the world. And we're hoping to solve that problem and help people understand how to get the screening they need. So you saw Dr. David Baines at his brother's graduation. Well, this particular trip to Alaska, I called him up and said, you know, David, I, my schedule is really tight. I'd love to get together, but I just can't quite fit it in. I have to go to Sitka tomorrow to talk to the doctors there about breast and colon cancer. And he said, oh, I invited some medical students to my house and we're gonna throw salmon on the grill. And I said, okay, you know how to get me all excited. So I went and spent a little time with David and the students and I said, gosh, I wish I was staying. I'd go salmon fishing with you. So David picks up his cell phone. He calls his cousin in Sitka, Michael, and he says, hey, Mikey, my friend Judith wants to go fishing at midnight tomorrow after her talks. Can you take her? Good, bye. Friends forever, colleagues forever. So David arranged for his cousin to take us and I called my student who was also there to talk about breast cancer and I said, you know, Matt, you've never been to Alaska. Go fishing with me at midnight. And he said, really, how do we do that? And I said, let's go get our, our king salmon tax stamp. And there we were, we were able to catch those two beautiful salmon. I mentioned my love of international travel and I particularly love visiting other countries with indigenous populations. This one happens to be a conference with the Pacific Rim indigenous doctors. What's unique about those conferences and SACNIS is that we share not only scientific knowledge, but indigenous knowledge and our, each other's cultures. And that's such a wonderful blessing to me. We've learned over many years of study that we can't use the same medicine for every patient. We have to individualize based on gender, age, race, ethnicity many times, or we are going to find that the medicine does not do what we want it to do. Well, along came COVID and it has turned your world and my world upside down. There will be many learnings that we make from this terrible disaster. And I do believe that we will even learn a lot about cancer vaccines from trying to develop vaccines for COVID. I think we also will learn that one vaccine is probably not going to be adequate. A vaccine for an older population is going to be different than for a younger population. The immune system is different over time. It may also be different for people who have comorbidities such as diabetes. So COVID can teach us a lot. With COVID, we have had to invent, improvise, be creative, what were we going to do with our patients if they couldn't all come to the clinic, but they still needed to have care? So I have a COVID office set up in my upstairs bedroom where I see patients with their families, with the family dog, and I'm able to do about 98% of what I would do for them if I was in the office. We even have remote monitoring for blood pressure and oxygenation and pulse and EKGs. So. COVID is teaching us to innovate and telemedicine is going to be a big part of our future. You saw my daughter when she was a little girl and now she has three children of her own. She has a 16 year old son and the oldest uh, daughter, granddaughter is 14. And then the little one on the left, Reese is now 12. When she was 10, she was picked for a STEM project at Northwestern University outside of Chicago, and she loved it. When I was there for Mother's Day last year, my son-in-law says, Grandma, she's been hearing about all kinds of scientific careers. Let her tell you what she likes. And I said, Reese, is there one you really like best of all? She looked at me and she said, Grandma, I want to be a pharmacogeneticist. Blew me away. <laughs> That career never existed when I was going through school. And I dare say many of you have probably never heard of it, but it is the wave of the future. New science is going to lead us forward. I love this quote from Louis Pasteur. Fortune favors the prepared mind. You work hard, 
but then you need to be open to opportunities as they present themselves. I know you will have lots and lots of opportunities to choose from. Thank you, Sockness, for this opportunity. Hope to see you all in person next year.